Father, we come before you right now again by the precious blood of the Lamb. What an honor it is to be able to come together as your people Israel, natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah Yeshua. Father, we just ask that you would lead us and guide us by your Spirit today as we study your Torah. Teach us your ways. We want to know you, Father. We just give you the praise, honor, and glory for all that you're doing. Hashem Yeshua Mishiach Enu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. All right, we've got another double portion this week. It's Akarimot and Kiddushim. And Akarimot is after the death. And Kiddushim, it's masculine plural for holy. Hope the holy ones is what it is. It's from Vayikra, or Leviticus, starting at chapter 16, verse 1. And it goes through chapter 20, verse 27. Let's start reading from Leviticus 16, 1. Now Yahweh spoke to Moshe after the death of the two sons of our Haron, when they offered profane fire before Yahweh. Strange fire is what other translations say. It was fire that Yahweh didn't ordain. It didn't come off the altar, obviously. They tried to make their own form of worship, and Yahweh didn't appreciate it. And they died. And Yahweh said to Moses, Tell our Haron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat, Thus Aharon shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Now notice they're not as fancy as his normal garments. They are plain but they're white. They represent sinlessness and separation to Yahweh. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two gids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. Aharon shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aharon shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other for the scapegoat, or in Hebrew it's Azazel. And Aharon shall bring the goat on which Yahweh's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aharon shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before Yahweh. This is exactly what Yahweh wants. Not strange fire. With his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat, on the east side, before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Now Yahweh is very specific in all this because this is exactly what he wants. It all means things. We don't necessarily always understand it, but the one thing that we can do is do what Yahweh wants to the letter. Because it's how we show him that we love him. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression or rebellions for all their sins. Now normally there is no sacrifice for willful intentional sin as we're going to study, but this particular sacrifice will cover all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meaning, which remains amongst, among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Skipping to verse 29. This shall be a statute forever for you. Now, why do we have a problem understanding forever? A lot of us believe this means until Jesus comes and does away with all this old ancient stuff. This is patterned after what goes on in the throne room. We've talked about this before. And when he says forever, he means forever. We need to take him at his word. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your soul and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. This is making clear that we know it's for everybody. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before Yahweh. 
It is a Shabbat, a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute. This is the third time in this passage he's told us. It's forever. He's very emphatic that we understand this. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as Yahweh commanded Moses. So again, all the sins of Israel this time, not just the ones done on accident, like all the other sacrifices atoned for. These, this even covers the willful intentional sins. If you're not stoned to death first and you can make it till Yom Kippur, then this sacrifice will cover your sins if you're truly repentant. It's an everlasting statute, and it's an everlasting picture of our salvation through Yeshua. Because the blood of bulls and goats really never did atone for sin. Hebrews brings this out. We know in Revelation chapter 13 that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth, foundation of the world, that His blood has always been what's atoned for our sin. Everything's always pointed towards that. All the sacrifices point to one or another aspect of what Yeshua did from the foundation of the world. So it was always His blood that is atoned for our sin. But what we were to do was obedience because it showed the Father that we loved Him and that we obeyed Him. So this was what this was all about. When we obeyed, then Yeshua's blood was applied to our lives. Hebrews 10.1 says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. They were never designed to. It was always the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, when He came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for Me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices or sin, you had no pleasure. Now why is that? Because he was tired of what he had established as pictures? No, it was because he would prefer that we obey and not have to offer sacrifices. Because that's what gives him glory. That's what shows him that we love him. But the sacrifices are done if we blow it. He made a way of return, made a way to come back to him. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifices and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. But yet he commanded them, but it was a default thing. In case we blew it, we had a way to come back, because he would rather us be obedient and not have to offer sacrifices, which are offered according to the Torah. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. So what did he take away? The eternal commandments that Yahweh just told us three times in this passage are to be done forever? Obviously not, because Yahweh's word is forever settled in heaven, and he doesn't contradict himself. Now we know Hebrews was written right before the destruction of the temple. So what he's, what he's doing is taking away the, the shadow pictures, the bulls and the goats. The temple's about to be destroyed, and we won't be able to do these anymore. Establishing the second is what these things always pointed to, but it just makes it clear that we have to rely on him in that spiritual sense, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Why is that? Because they never were designed to. It was always the blood of the Lamb Yeshua, slain from the foundation of the world. It's always been His blood. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and when did he do it? From the foundation of the world. Because Yahweh lives outside of the realm of time. That's why it was a done deal from the beginning. It was always His plan to atone because He knew we were going to blow it and He had a way of escape from the very beginning. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, 
from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. When is that going to be? It's after he returns and he deals with everybody and as we're going to see from the message today it all ends at the great white throne when death and hell are cast in the lake of fire because he's going to rule until his, all of his enemies are under his feet and the last enemy it says in 1 Corinthians 15 is death and we're going to read those scriptures here in a little bit. So he's been seated from the foundation of the world until the time when death is dealt with. This is the, well, actually until he comes back and rules and reigns for a thousand years but then he hands everything back over to Yahweh because he's going to be sitting on his throne at the temple in Jerusalem. He says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says Yahweh, that I will put my Torah into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. See, the instructions didn't change. It's still his Torah, the same Torah that we've always had, but now he internalizes them. He adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So what does that mean? Obviously Yeshua died 2,000 years ago, but there were still offerings for sin. Paul was going to do one, the vow of the Nazarite. He, they were doing them up until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. But these were all pictures. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Yeshua. See, what it did with the temple destruction, it forced us to look at what the temple was always pointing us to, and it made it clear that we have to rely on Him, our true high priest. And it gives us boldness. When we're born again and we have His Spirit within and He writes His Torah in our hearts and this is now our desire, we understand that we've been sanctified by His precious blood. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And just to make it clear that he's not doing away with anything in the Torah, he says, anyone who re has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is when Hebrews was written. It's the death penalty to reject the Torah, Moses' law. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, Yahweh will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So willful, intentional sin... It's a sin unto death. It has the death penalty with it. We see this in Numbers 15, starting at verse 22. Hebrews makes it clear in chapter 10 that it's still a real issue when Hebrews was written, which is right before 70 AD. Numbers 15, 22. If you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments which Yahweh has spoken to Moses, all that Yahweh has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day Yahweh gave commandment and onward throughout your generations, then it will be, if it is unintentionally committed, without the knowledge of the congregation, that the whole congregation shall offer one young bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma to Yahweh with its grain offering, its drink offering, according to the ordinance, and one kid of the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was unintentional. They shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, and their sin offering before Yahweh for their unintended sin. It shall be forgiven the whole congregation, the children of Israel, and the stranger who dwells among them, because all the people did it unintentionally. And if a person, an individual, sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally, when he sins unintentionally before Yahweh, to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. 
You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native born among the children of Israel, and the stranger who dwells among them. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on Yahweh, and he shall be cut off from among his people. In other words, you sin on purpose, you are cut off. Because he has despised the word of Yahweh and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. So obedience to Yahweh's Torah it was a matter of not only our salvation, but a matter of life. And when Hebrews was written, it was still the same way. It wasn't that the blood of Yeshua did away with all this. When the temple was destroyed, there was no way for us to do these commandments then at that point. So then we just had to, like 1 John 1 says, 1, 1 9 says, confess our sin, and then he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. But these pictures were still valid as long as there was a temple. Numbers 15.32 shows us what the penalty for intentional sin was. Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then Yahweh said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. This is what cut off from among your people means. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. Now this seems harsh, but this man did it on purpose. He knew better and he willfully and intentionally did what he wanted to do anyway. And in order to keep this spirit out of the camp, he was taken outside and put to death. All the people stoned him with stones. Because it would spread like a cancer if we didn't do it. But also, knowing you're about to be stoned to death, it would really give you some motivation to repent and ask Yahweh to forgive you. It's like the men on death row, the ones that really have made Yahweh Yeshua their Lord. They're not playing games. And when they are ready to get the needle, they're ready to go. And you can tell. And it has a way, knowing that you're going to die, of either making you very hard and cold and bitter and not wanting to have anything to do or driving you back to Yahweh. And people that are raised with this, they're going to be driven back to Yahweh for the most part. It's His mercy so that they won't be cast in the lake of fire when we stand before Him and judgment is rendered. And again, Hebrews 10.28, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, this is present tense in the Greek, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. It is the death penalty to reject the Torah. And if the Torah was our civil law like it was in Israel back when it was given, if it was the civil law in this land today, there would be very few pulpits still filled with preachers because most of them teach willful and intentional violation of the Torah. And it's a death penalty. It's a serious thing. Although I'll bet you this first, as, you, as soon as you killed one or two of them, the rest of them would get with the program and <laughs> realize that, oh, <laughs> this is serious. So. But that was the whole point. When you did it to one or two people, it made everybody else stand up and take notice that Yahweh means business. We had better continue to walk in His ways. So this is still the case at the time of the writing of Hebrews. Rejecting Yahweh's Torah, His instructions contained in the Torah, given to us by Yeshua, the angel that was with us given us the living oracles as we read. It was Yeshua at Mount Sinai that was given us the Torah. It was still a sin unto death. The sacrificial system only dealt with our unintentional sins. To sin willfully was to reject Yahweh's instructions, thus rejecting Yahweh's lordship over your life. Because that's what Torah really means. It's the teaching or the instructions of our Father. And it's really, as we're going to study, it's His definition to know how to love. If you remained in this unrepented state, even though you were a child of the covenant saved by faith in Yahweh Himself, you would be cut off from His covenant body, His people, and be eternally lost. Now since there was no regular personal sacrifice that an individual could bring to Yahweh for intentional sin, Yahweh wanted to make a way for the truly repentant to return to Him. And Yom Kippur was this way. The goat that was sacrificed atoned for all the sins of Israel. but. With Yeshua's sacrifice, which was done from the foundation of the world, it atoned for everybody's. Everybody's always had a way back if they were truly in repentant. Now the goat that was sacrificed made an atonement for all the sins of Israel, including the intentional sins of rebellion. The remaining goat had all the sins of Israel placed upon its head, and it was removed to the wilderness. And if we remember when Yeshua was crucified, we've talked about this before, 
it was a picture of Yom Kippur. Even though it was done at Passover, you still had the Lamb of God offered up for sin, who was the Father's son, and then you had Barabbas, which literally means son of the Father, let go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now the sins were not wiped out. They were removed from Israel and atoned for. Atonement literally means Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement is how it's translated. How many of you realize that the word for the head covering that Jews wear, it's called a kippah? It's the same root as kippur. It means covering. Now, that's all it means. It's the day of covering. The sins were actually not done away with. They were covered. Now, Psalms 103 paints a vivid picture of this desire of Yahweh to remove the transgressions and rebellions from the truly repentant. Psalms 103, it was a psalm of David. He says, Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yahweh executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made way, know, uh, known His ways unto Moses and His acts unto the children of Israel. Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. He is merciful. For as high as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards them that fear Him. Now notice it's always conditional. He's merciful to those that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pities his children, so Yahweh pities them that fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows that we're going to blow it. As for men, His days are as of grass, as a flower of the field. So He flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. And His righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep His covenant, and to those that remember His commandments, to do them. He wants to bless us, but we have to do our part. We need to be obedient. But it's by His Spirit. His Spirit's within us, causing us to walk in His statutes, to keep His judgments, to do them. Now, if we study Isaiah 53 carefully, we can see that the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua is the ultimate fulfillment of the sacrifice for willful and rebellious sin. Our obligation to Yahweh as we walk in covenant with Him by the blood of the Lamb Yeshua is to fear Him, keep His covenant, and remember His commandments to do them. Now notice that in Psalms 103, it states that Yahweh removes our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. It doesn't say that He forgets them or destroys them. He covers them. Now Paul confirms this as well as, as he quotes David from Psalms 32. This is Romans 4, starting at verse 6. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh shall not impute sin. So if we remain repentant and continue to walk in obedience to Yahweh's teaching and instructions, we will remain separated from our sins. We will continue to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Like it says in 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Yeshua Messiah His Son cleanses us from all sin. So now we can't do a sacrifice of an animal for, willful or for unintentional sin. What it is is as we're walking in the light, as we're obeying what we can obey, then His blood automatically is cleansing us of these unintentional sins. We don't even know when we're sinning, but yet His blood is still washing us, keeping us clean. Now, through the sacrifice of Yom Kippur, it would cover the sins of the truly repentant. Ezekiel points out that a righteous man who refuses to repent will die in his sins and that his righteousness will not be remembered, which means that all those sins that he's committed will be remembered because they're, they're being written down. Ezekiel 3.17 says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, You shall surely die, and you give him not warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. 
Yet if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, you have delivered your soul. So all of the Moedim, or the appointed times, the feast days as they're translated sometimes, of Yahweh, are physical pictures of the spiritual realities that are yet to come. Colossians 2.16 and 17 tells us this. Now Yom Kippur will ultimately be fulfilled at the great white throne judgment. It is also the day that the year of Jubilee is proclaimed on, and I believe it's the day that Yeshua is going to return on because it's the day that the last trumpet is sounded on, like Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the last trumpet of the older Jubilee cycle, and it announces the new Jubilee cycle as well. Now, the people that is, have made Yeshua their master and have stayed submitted to his lordship and are truly repentant and obedient will hear when we stand before him, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then those who have never made Yeshua their, their master, their Lord, have never been born again, but had refused to be obedient and refused to repent, will hear, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In this day and age, as we're walking in the part of the new covenant Yeshua established by his blood at his first coming, in order for our names to be written in the Lamb's book of life, we must be born again, as he told Nicodemus in the book of John. Accepting the blood of the sacrifice of Yeshua as a covering for our sin and making Yeshua our Lord, it's not optional for the Jew or the non-Jew. Just because the Jew was raised with Torah and was circumcised on the, eighth day, on the eighth day, they still sin, and the wages of sin is still death. And it's not good enough to be born of the right family line. You have to make Yeshua your Lord. His blood has to be applied to your life. You have to be born again. Now, there's been a false doctrine, a doctrine of demons taught in some of the denominations in the Christian church called eternal security. And there's even a more damnable doctrine than that now. It's this extreme grace teaching. They teach that we can't sin that the blood of Yeshua atoned for our sin past, present, and future, and once you're born again, it's a done deal. It's not what Scripture teaches, though. What Scripture teaches is that if we willfully sin, there's no more sacrifice for our sin. Because we can sin, because sin, defined in the Scripture, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, says it is the violation of the Torah. It's a very dangerous teaching because it gives the believers a false sense of security while they continue to live in their sin, that they're being lied to and saying that it's not really sin anymore because it's been dealt with. They don't even teach that you should repent. And they teach that you shouldn't even try to walk in obedience because you're taken away from the sacrifice of Yeshua if you do. That is the most damnable thing you've ever heard. Now the believers that have accepted this lie will be in for an unfortunate surprise at the great white throne because all their deeds are being recorded. Now let's take a closer look what to expect on the Day of Judgment. In Hebrews 9.27 it says, And it is appointed other men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Every man's going to appear before the great white throne. There's not a separate judgment for believers and non-believers. We will all appear before the great white throne and be judged by Yeshua, not the Father. Yeshua said, The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment under the sun. So it's Yeshua himself that's going to be sitting on that great white throne. We see this in Matthew 25 when Yeshua is judging between the nations. That's when he told the ones that were righteous to receive the inheritance prepared for them from the foundation and the ones that were wicked to depart into the lake of fire. So reward and penalty are being meted out at this judgment. Matthew 25, 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now look at Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, starting at verse 9. It says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, 
So who's this Ancient of Days? It's actually Yeshua sitting on the throne. Because the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And the hair on his head, like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now this word books is plural. It would be sepharim for those of us that are taking the Hebrew class. The Ancient of Days in Daniel is none other than Yeshua himself. It's the description of Yeshua in Revelation 1. Starting at verse 13, In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to his feet, and girded about his chest with a gold band. His, hair, or his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as a ref refined in a furnace, and his voice as sounds of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. Revelation 20:12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there's plural books and the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Your works are being recorded. All of our works are being recorded. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Now some of them are, he's going to say, well done my good and faithful servant. And some of them are going to, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now as we're going to study, we're going to see your name could have been written in the book of life. And it could have been blotted out. So just having it written there by being born again is not enough to guarantee that you're going to make it. We still have to abide through obedience. But it's easy because His Spirit's in us telling us to. Wanting, giving us the desire and the ability to walk in obedience. But if we listen to the lies of the enemy and, and, and they say that it's not right to try to obey, your name's going to be blotted out. Now again, this is Yeshua seated on the great white throne. As He said in John 5.22, The Father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the Son. Paul gives us his witness as well in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 24. He says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. And then he tells us the timing on this. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that happens at the great white throne at the end of the judgment. Everybody that's not written in the books cast in the lake of fire and death and hell are cast there too. So this is when the last enemy is dealt with after he finishes his judgment sitting on the great white throne then he hands it all over to the Father and then we have the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and it happens right there at the end of the great white throne. And like I said, after this, Yeshua hands everything back to the Father. Now we've all heard about the book of life and the importance of our names being written in it. Now notice besides the book of life, there were other books, plural, that were opened as well. Let's look a little closer at these other books. According to the verse 12 above, we're told that we will be judged according to our works. He's recording all of our works. Now even our good works are not necessarily all going to stand. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that our works are going to be tried in the fire. The ones that are wood, hay, and stubble are going to be burned up, but the, the ones that are gold, silver, and precious stones are going to make it through the fire. So these are the ones that actually have their names written in the book of life. Matthew 5, 15, 17 says, Do you not understand that whatsoever enters at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth comes forth from the heart. Then they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications. Now remember, Yeshua said, even if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. So these things that are in your heart, it's just like you did them, if that's what's in your heart. Thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. 
These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. And as we studied earlier, it's, he's not talking about eating pork, because that will defile a man. But to eat the kosher animals with unwashed hands, like the Pharisees said, they say you're defiled if you don't do your blessing just right beforehand. Yeshua is saying that's not the case. It's the things of the heart that defiles a man. Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So you can discern what kind of a man a person is by what comes out of their mouth, which is in their heart. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So one of these books, he's writing down everything we say. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now if we say some things that we shouldn't have said, we can repent for that. We can ask Him to forgive us, and He will cover those sins, and as long as we're abiding in Him, they'll stay covered. But there again, if we turn from our righteousness, like Ezekiel says, all those words are going to be there, and we're going to be judged by them. Our words will either justify us or they'll condemn us. Now in John 12, 42, it says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Yeshua cried out and said, He that believes on me believes not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that sees me sees him's, him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whatso, whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hears my words and believes not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, that's at his first coming, but to save the world. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that His commandment is life everlasting. There is life in His Torah. Whatsoever I speak thereof, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So the words that Yeshua spoke, everything was directly from the Father. He spoke the Torah at Mount Sinai. He's the one that gave us the Torah to Moses, through Moses. It was the teachings and the instructions of the Father. Now the Torah, which is also called the Law of Moses, are the teachings and instructions of the Word made flesh. That's John 1, 1 through 10. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeshua is the living Word, the Torah made flesh. And that's going to be one of the books we're judged by. Did you walk in obedience to what He showed you from the Torah? Because it is literally His instructions. I mean, it's just goofy. We, we've all talked about cults. The cults that everybody recognizes are those usually that have extra writings that they add to the word that they follow that they place in authority above the word but the biggest cult of all actually takes away from the word and tries to explain why we shouldn't walk in it anymore the definition of a cult is to either add or to take away from the word just like he told us not to do in the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 and the last verse of chapter 12 just because there's a lot of people in the group doesn't mean it's not a cult. Just because it's a mainstream, recognized denomination or ministry doesn't mean it's not a cult. What determines whether it's a cult or not, or do they walk like Yeshua walked? Do they obey the scripture Yeshua obeyed? And do they follow the same spirit that Yeshua followed? That's how you can tell what's a cult and what's not. Now let's look at another witness of what Yeshua says as he's sitting on this throne. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What's his will? What's he written on our hearts? That's his will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And they're not lying. They did these things. But then he says, I will declare them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And in the Greek, it literally is the word for abolishing the Torah. You're teaching that it was nailed to the cross and you don't do it anymore? This is going to be the penalty. This is some serious stuff. You who practice lawlessness. 
It doesn't matter if you're born again and you have the Spirit, you're casting out devils and you're healing the sick, raising the dead. 1 Corinthians 13.2 is a parallel scripture. It says you can, you can have all knowledge, all wisdom, understanding, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. And love has to be by His definition because that's what the Torah is, is His definition of how to love. Yeshua told us it hangs on two commands. Love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. The rest of it hangs on those two because it's the details on how to do those two. He explains in detail how to love our neighbor, how to love Yahweh. Part of it's what we're doing today, meeting on His holy Shabbat. We're showing Him that we love Him. So Yeshua tells us that He will reject these believers who are performing miracles in His name and by His Spirit because they practice lawlessness. He says, I never knew you. That's just what Ezekiel was talking about. If you die in your iniquity, which we know sin is the violation of the Torah, these guys were Torah-less. They threw it all away. He says, your righteousness won't be remembered. That's why He says, I never knew you. It's blotted out. You've died in your sin. All I can see now is everything written in my book. And they're going to have to stand accountable because they didn't obey. They listened to the doctrines of demons being taught. Now we know that these believers were doing it by the Spirit of Yahweh because Yeshua told us in Matthew 12, 26 that Satan will not cast out Satan. They'd thrown away his Torah. They rejected his words. We can't do the will of our Father if we throw away His Word. Refusing to obey His Torah, His written instructions that are contained in the book but supposedly written in our hearts, it could cost you your eternity. Matthew 25, 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, He shall sit upon His throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He shall see it set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And in our Torah portion this week, it says you're to clothe the stranger. You're to love the stranger, because we were strangers in Egypt. This is part of it. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. Then he shall also say unto them on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hunger or thirsty or, thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you? Then shall I answer them saying, Verily, I say unto you, and as much as you did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous in the life eternal. See, it doesn't matter if you say you're walking in love. It's just like the strange fire that we talked about in our Torah portion. It doesn't matter if you're close to what the commandment says. If you've deviated from it and you've thrown out His definition of love, which is what His Torah is all about, and you've made up your own, and you now have homosexual bishops in your church and transgender Baptist ministers and all this other garbage going on, the divorce rate's higher in your church than it is in the world, Guess what? It's acceptance. It's not love. Love is not acceptance. Love is taking the man gathering sticks on Shabbat and stoning him to death because that example would spread through the camp and cause many to be lost if it's not dealt with. That is what love is. Sometimes it's tough. Accepting people is not love. Loving people and then showing them that there's sin in their life and praying for them, that is love. But you don't make them comfortable in their sin. So these are all things regarding loving our neighbor that Yeshua is judging us by, but they also apply to loving Yahweh, because whatever we do, the least of these, his brothers, it's doing it unto him. Our works that we do to fellow believers are being recorded in another book as well, and we're going to be judged by them. Now in Ephesians 2.8, 
We're told, for by grace we've been saved through faith. Not, not, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't earn your salvation, is what he's telling us. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, once you're born again and you have His Spirit living within you, it's going to cause you to walk in His statutes, to keep His judgments, to do them. It's the good works after we're born again that gives Him glory. You can't earn it by just doing the good works. You have to be born again. Now the importance of the good works is overlooked by most traditional ministers. The good works that can't bring us into covenant with Yahweh are the same good works that He expects us to walk in after we've been born again by grace, through faith. The question that we need to ask is, what is faith comprised of? Because Paul doesn't really give us the definition of faith. He just tells us that Abraham was saved by faith and we have to be saved by faith too. What is faith? Well, James gives us the nitty-gritty details. In James chapter 2, starting at verse 14, it says, What does it profit, my brothers? Though a man says he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, just like we were reading about in Matthew 25, and one of you says unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and be filled, speaking words of faith over them, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Absolutely nothing. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. And that doesn't mean it was never faith, it just means as we're going to study, we're going to see it has to be perfected. Yea, a man may say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Talk is cheap. It's where the deeds are what, where the rubber meets the road, as to say. You believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now, Paul tells us he was saved by faith and not by works in Romans chapter 4. And that's true. He couldn't earn his salvation. But what his faith was comprised of is what James is telling us about here. Abraham offered up Isaac as the works that perfected his faith. He circumcised his own flesh and those of his household by faith, which perfected his, or by works, which perfected his faith. If he'd have refused either one, his faith would have died. Doesn't mean it wasn't ever faith to start with. It just means that it has to be perfected through the obedience. Otherwise, it will die. And the scripture was fulfilled which said again, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. It's not just the talk. Not just believing. It's the action that you put behind it after you believe and you speak. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Our faith is a work in progress. James is explaining this. It has to be perfected. It has to continue to grow or it will die. If you refuse to walk in obedience, your faith will die doesn't mean you never had faith. It doesn't mean you weren't born again. It just means that your faith is dead. And then he's going to have to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Yeshua, the author, he gives to each man the measure of faith, and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith. But yet we have to work with him. We have to work with his spirit, which is causing us to walk in obedience. We still have to choose to obey. If Abraham had refused to offer up Isaac, Abraham's faith would have become dead. Obedience to Yahweh, whether by direct communication, his spirit leading us, or from his written Torah, it's all an integral part of faith. If we refuse to obey, our faith becomes dead. That's if we continue to refuse. I mean, just blowing it once. He gives us the scripture. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us. All we have to do is repent, and we can jump right back in there, and His blood is continually cleansing us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So this is talking about a habitual lifestyle of refusing to obey, refusing to repent. In Romans 3.20 it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he's saying you can't keep the law to be born again, basically. The law is going to show you where your sin is. 
But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Yeshua Messiah unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God has set before to be the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Now again, what is sin? The violation of the Torah. His blood pays the price for our past offenses that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Yeshua. Where is boasting in? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No! But by the law of faith. But as we just learned, what is the law of faith? It's believing God and then acting in obedience once we do. Once we're born again by His Spirit, now we walk in the obedience that we could never earnest our salvation. You can keep the Torah all day long. If you're never born again, it will not save you. It's only once we're born again, once we're washed in His blood, and now we have His Spirit, then it perfects our faith. And that's the difference between the letter of the law, which kills, because if you're trying to earn your salvation through keeping the law, it'll kill you. You'll die and go to hell just like the guy picking up sticks on Shabbat. But if you walk in obedience after you're born again as an act of love for our Father and for our fellow neighbor, there's life in that obedience. Verse 28, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid! Yea, we establish the law. That's the whole point. Once His Spirit's in us, it's causing us to walk in obedience to His Torah. Although keeping the law, He makes it clear, that won't get you saved. It won't get you born again. But once we are saved by faith in the blood of Yeshua, then we're establishing the law, which means we're going to obey it. So walking in obedience to Yahweh's Torah is not what brings us into covenant with Him initially. It was never designed for that. We come into the covenant with Yahweh through the faith in the shed blood of Messiah Yeshua. We have to make Him our Lord and our Master. And part of making Him Lord and Master is knowing that He is... See, we've got to preach the right Jesus to start with, the right Yeshua. He is the Torah made flesh. And if we're preaching the gospel correctly to start with, the people are going to know that this is the Bible and this is what Yahweh expects us to obey once we're born again. We're born again by His Spirit, and this is our instruction manual. But yet the one being presented most of the time is that He did away with all this other stuff. You don't actually have to follow this book. Even though we're saying this is God's Word, just, just ignore this first part and just keep the second part. It's insane. That's not even logical. We establish the Torah through faith because obedience to Yahweh's teaching and instructions by His Spirit is part of our faith. It's the natural result of being born by His Spirit. Ezekiel explains it to us, verse, uh, chapter 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments to do them. So we can know if we have Yahweh's spirit or not by what is the spirit we're being led by causing us to do. Just whatever we want because Yeshua already paid the price for all the sin? Or is it causing us to walk in obedience? Because there's different spirits out there. There's a different Yeshua that Paul warns us about. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the first four verses, gives us the details. So if we don't have a desire to obey Yahweh's Torah, it can only be because we have not grown to the point that we're ready for Him to reveal His truth to us or we're really not of His Spirit at all. We've been brainwashed, a lot of us, to think that the Torah was done away with. A lot of us were really born again, but then the bad teaching we got turned us away from Yahweh's Torah. But if we continue to seek Him, eventually He's going to lead us into an understanding of that. Romans 7.7 7. Paul tells us, show, what shall we say then? Is the Torah sin? God forbid! No, I had not known sin, but by the Torah. In 1 John 3.4, again it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. That is the definition of sin, biblically. 
So Paul points out that the Torah is our gauge to know what sin is, and John makes it clear that to violate the Torah is the biblical definition for sin. In 1 John 3, 1, Yeshua is talking to this assembly at Sardis. To the messenger, or the angel of the church of Sardis writes, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard Hold fast and repent. Return back to the Torah. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy, and the rest of them are not. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, and before his angels. Well, what about the ones that don't overcome? He's going to blot their name out. Doesn't mean it was never written in because they were born again, but they refused to walk in obedience. They refused to walk in his definition of love, and that got their names blotted out. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So Yeshua has given us a compassionate warning. He doesn't want to blot our names out. He wants us to walk in obedience. These believers, again, they're part of the assembly in Sardis. But their works are not perfect before Yahweh. Their faith is not being perfected. He tells them to repent, to overcome, to return back to Torah. He makes it clear that if they don't, their names will be blotted out of His book of life. Yeshua makes it very clear here that just being born again is, and having our names written in His book, it's not enough to enter in at the straight gate. We have to endure, we have to overcome so that our names aren't blotted out. Now let's look at another scripture in Exodus 32:33. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, in other words, whoever has violated my Torah, him will I blot out of my book. Now here we see very clearly that our names will be blotted out if we sin against Yahweh. By not following Yahweh's teachings and instructions given to us in his Torah, we're deviating from his path and his ways. He's really not our Lord and our Master if we're not following his teachings. Our Father wants us to overcome. This is His will. This is why He gave us the book. It's our instruction manual. All we have to do is read it. Once we're born again, His Spirit will open it to us. He's laid out a path in His Word that we can follow that will ensure us the victory. We will overcome if we follow it. We just have to follow it. We have to be careful not to add anything to it, not to take anything away from it. Yeshua gives us great insight in understanding this path. In Matthew 7, 13, he says, Enter you in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. In order to find it, we have to be diligently seeking him. In Hebrews, it says that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Luke 13.22 makes it even more clear. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. He's telling this guy, seeking is not going to get you there. You have to strive. Well, this word in the Greek is the word agonizomai. And it was used in classical Greek to describe the the effort the Olympic athletes were putting forth when they were running the race, when they were wrestling in the wrestling match. They were giving it everything they had to win. They weren't holding anything back. They were giving it all. And it's what he's describing. Our, our race, our walk has to be. We have to hold nothing back. It's, it's covenant language, really. When we enter blood covenant, we are giving ourselves completely to our covenant partner. And they're giving themselves completely to us. Marriage is supposed to be a picture of that. But Yahweh, marriage is a picture of our relationship to Him through Yeshua. So we give ourselves completely to Him. We hold nothing back. We get up in the morning. He is the reason why we open our eyes and His praises are on our lips. It's all about Him. We're created in His likeness, in His image, to walk with Him in the cool of the day. 
And we do this by renewing our minds. When, when we renew our minds and we're thinking his thoughts, it's just automatic. We have that fellowship. Where Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. He uses the same word there. It's the picture of the Olympic wrestling match. You've given it everything you have. Lay hold on eternal life is what he tells Timothy. That's how we do it. It's through giving it everything. In 1 Corinthians 9.24, he uses it again. He says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize? He's talking about the Olympic Games. So run that you might obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery, again, it's that word agonizomai, is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown or gold medal in our culture, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's revealing that he wasn't saved fully. He was saved by faith, but if he stopped, if he didn't keep his body under, he would be rejected just like anybody else. Because until we stand before him and he says, well done my good and faithful servant, we still have to abide in him. And that's through our obedience. It's easy once we make that decision and nobody can knock us off of it because we have his spirit living within us. Causing us to walk in his statutes to keep his judgments to do them. But our flesh is battling against that and that's where we have to win the fight. It's by what we do with our mind. Do we renew our mind with his word? Or do we fill it with junk of the world that gives the flesh more power? So we still have to choose what we're going to do. We have the ability to win, to overcome, to endure to the end. Now we know that Paul was already born again when he wrote this letter. I mean, he was going around establishing churches and doing miracles, so there's no question about that. But again, he's saying that even he didn't have it made yet. He still had to keep his flesh under, his body under. Otherwise, he'd be rejected and counted worthless. In other words... Yeshua would have to say to him, Depart from me, I never knew you. Because it's how we finish the race that counts. Nobody can knock us off of it. We just have to get up every day and determine, I am going to walk after the Spirit of Yahweh today. His Spirit's in me and I'm going to renew my mind to His Word. And nobody can keep us from it. But we have to understand, we still have to work out the process. We still have to take the initiative and do it because it doesn't happen automatically. Paul understood that just being born again and just seeking to enter in wasn't good enough. You had to give him everything. You don't just make him the Lord of your Shabbat and then live the rest of the week not even thinking about him. He is our Lord at every hour of the day. Everything we do in word or in deed we're supposed to be doing for him. In Luke 12, 42, and the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. The one that's walking in obedience. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But, and if that servant says in his heart, My Lord delays his coming. See, this guy is still a servant. He's born again. But he shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and to drink and be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in two, asunder, and will point him his portion with the unbelievers. He gets the same reward, even though he was born again and he was a servant, because he didn't abide. He didn't give it everything. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, in other words, ignorant Christians that really never read their Bible, but did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. They won't be beaten as bad as the willfully sinful. But they will be beaten with few stripes. And guess what? The beatings don't take place in the New Jerusalem. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So though this man was a servant and not an unbeliever, because he had stopped striving to enter in at the straight gate, because he refused to walk in obedience, 
because he was lied to and said you don't have to anymore. It doesn't matter. You're going to be beaten with stripes one way or the other. His faith became dead. Without Yahweh's Torah, he's going to have to say, depart from me. I don't know you. You can't love without his Torah. That's the whole point. We can also see here that as well as in Matthew 25 that ignorance to Yahweh's Torah, it won't be an excuse. Yeshua wants us to rule and to reign with him. He's given us the instructions. He's given us the warning so that we can choose to have life. The Father wants to give us the kingdom. In order to inherit the kingdom, we first have to enter in by the way that he prescribes. We can't make up our own way. I'm going to go ahead and stop here. There's many, many more scriptures that Yeshua shows us that tells us that we have to choose. We have to continue to abide in Him through obedience. As His Spirit leads us, it's His Spirit within us leading us to walk in obedience. He wants us because it's all about love. It's all about loving the Father. It's all about loving our brothers. And without His Torah, we can't love. We've thrown out His definition of love and made up our own. It's strange fire. And he won't accept strange fire. He's given us the book. All we have to do is read it. All we have to do is believe it. From Genesis to Revelation, Yeshua is our guide. If we see him walking in it, it's good for us. He was our example. He's the prototype. Paul himself, all the disciples, look at how they worshipped. The early believers, they were at the temple every day. They understood that this is new covenant worship. I mean, for 40 years they're doing new covenant worship at the temple. It is the highest form of worship that they could have done. When it was destroyed, they couldn't do it anymore. But the temple is going to be built again. And we have to understand that if it's in Yahweh's Torah, it's forever, just like he told us today. Three times, this is to be done forever. It's eternal. If he says forever, take him at his word. Because he's given us the road map to make it through, to endure to the end. Satan's going to try to knock you off of it. He's going to have lying shepherds, lying false apostles and prophets come and say, you don't have to do this anymore. It's nailed to the cross. It's done away with. God changed his mind. Well, maybe your God did, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said it's to be done forever. He's very clear in what he tells us. We just have to take him at his word. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your Torah. We thank you for your teaching and your instructions. You've given us the way of life. You've given us your instructions. You've given us your spirit. You've given us examples to follow. Father, just continue to open our eyes. Continue to draw us by your Holy Spirit to walk in your ways. We love you, Father, and we want to always walk in your love by your definition. Father, you've made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, P'navelecha, V'hunecha. Yisah Yahweh, May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up His countenance towards you and give you His peace, His shalom, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. Hallelujah.